you can probably tell from the title of this video that this is part of a long ongoing process that I'm involved with. And if you've been watching my channel then you'll know that uh, some time ago I posted a series of videos on repairing this REN computer. Uh, in fact I had two RENs to repair and uh, now I have three. So this is kind of um, building up but the issue that I had at the time was I got it as far as being able to boot into the welcome screen when I first powered up the REN and I got both of them up to the same point. The reason I'm coming back to address this is because uh, I've since been sent a third machine to look at and been able to make a bit of progress but I want to uh, essentially restart this uh, repair sequence and see if we can get a bit further this time. Obviously the ultimate goal is to be able to boot from floppy disk into the REN operating system and the uh, goal really is to be able to help anyone out there that's got a REN that won't boot um, but it's not as simple as it may seem each of the RENs that I have has a whole host of hardware faults but before we look into that what I'll do I'll clear this off the bench and we'll have a quick look at why I'm restarting this um, repair process and why I hope to get a bit further through it this time uh, and also at the end of, the, of this video I want to um, throw out a request for assistance and uh, for anyone that wants to get involved with this it might make an interesting project but before we get to that as I say I'll clear the bench and we'll have a look at why uh, I think it's worth pursuing this a bit further this time okay so unfortunately I don't have any um, video capture software on my laptop so I'll just have to point the camera at the screen but uh, we need to be able to see the floppy drive anyway so the setup I have here is one of the disk um, analysis systems that I have and I've tried this same thing with a number of different systems I have and I get the same results on all of them and this one's the easiest to demonstrate so what we have here this is a cryoflux system and it allows me to do different levels of reading and um, down to raw uh, stream reading from floppy drives so this is one of the floppy drives out of the REN I've tried all six drives that I currently have from the RENs and I get the same results on, on five of them. One of the drives is uh, dead, need repairing, but the other five give me identical results and those five drives work fine in other machines. So I'm fairly confident the drives themselves are fine. But the problem I had with the first REN was this is the operating system disk that came with it and it might be difficult to see, but I think this had been left in the machine for quite a number of years and um, it's been uh, fairly badly damaged and so when I try and read this it doesn't um, make any attempt to boot when I put it into the REN but when I try to read the disk so we'll do a quick test and this will do a fairly low level read of the, uh, the disk So what it's showing here is each of the tracks it's trying to read and if it's showing it as grey then it's uh, bad, it can't read it. If it shows it with an H for example it's got hidden data, that is the header doesn't match the data that's on the track. And green is um, a good read and a red is uh, completely unreadable. So you'll see that as we go through this that there are uh, quite a few good readable tracks but the problem is that the first ones which are the ones that we are interested in and the ones that we need to enable the REN to start booting are corrupt. This is normally a sign that the disk was in the drive when the machine was powered up and there were some issues and it's um, overwritten or corrupted the uh, data or it's mechanical damage with the disk being left in the drive each time it starts up the heads kind of uh, gouge into the disk and you get uh, damage to the surface so that was as far as I went because I didn't have uh, any way to proceed I didn't have any boot information that would enable me to continue with the repair process and I would of course need that if I was going to uh, go through and, and fully diagnose and correct the boot process itself the boot process on the REN is quite complex, we'll have a look at that later in the video. But what we ended up with is uh, a friend has recently bought a REN and the seller um, sent a full set of disks with it 
and uh, this is the boot disc as you can see it looks to be in much better condition so let's give this a go and see what happens so we'll try reading this disc So as we can see the disc is reading fairly well. Now there are some bad sectors on here that don't read very well. I've managed to recover some of them. I've very carefully cleaned and straightened out part of the disc and some damage on it. Um, when I first got this it wouldn't read some of these tracks at all. You can hear it's struggling to read some of them now but it is going through and it is managing to successfully read most of them. So I've got it set to retry multiple times and it uh, tries to reassemble data. Some of the tracks it can't read at all, they are damaged. And I, I don't think this is mechanical damage, I think um, this is where the, again the disc was left in the drive when the machine was powered up or powered down. And I think some of the data has been overwritten. Uh, I think the earlier issues I've seen on this disc are possibly um, mechanical damage to it. There are some scratches on the surface but by moving the head very slightly um, I was able to kind of work around that damage and it is now successfully reading. And for these to be read as good the header in each of the tracks has to match the actual data. Uh, it's not a case of it just reading uh, garbage and, and thinking it's good. Uh, also there's uh, other checks that have been carried out that I'll come to in a few minutes. So as you can see it's struggling but it is managing to read the bulk of data but the important thing with this disc is the first six tracks read reliably every time and because the boot sequence starts with these first tracks then it doesn't really matter what's on the rest of the disc from the uh, diagnosing the machine and getting it to start booting uh, if it can just get through reading the first tracks then the machine should be fine. Uh, it won't boot up if it's a uh, corrupt operating system disk of course but at least it will show that the machine is capable of going through the boot process which is what we're trying to uh, sort out next. So as you can see this disk is actually viable so what we ended up with was this disk but also the um, friend that bought the most recent Wren contacted the seller. He in turn contacted the person that originally owned the Wren and luckily that person had taken some images off the original boot disc um, presumably some time ago before the disc was damaged. He sent those files through and what we end up with is something that looks like this. I don't know how well this is coming out on camera but it looks like garbage but there is some text in there and it does appear from the text that it possibly is a Wren boot disc, a Wren boot disc image. And so what I did was to process this file and create an IMG file from it. It's a two-step uh, process, but you end up with an IMG file. And the purpose of creating the IMG file was so that I could use the next tool in this process, which is one of these. This is a GoTech floppy drive emulator. And really what it does, it allows you to put um, disk images, image files onto a removable media, a memory stick, and then this will emulate uh, what the floppy drive is doing it uh, with different uh, floppy disks inserted. So for example, if we create an image that's supposed to match this disk and we put it onto an IMG file on the GoTech, then the GoTech should behave as if though it's a physical floppy drive with this disk in it. So that's um, what I did. I created the IMG file. Uh, also another friend uh, independently created a copy of the IMG file from the same uh, source file, from the same TD0 file. And we compared the one that uh, the IMG file that he created with the one that I created and they were identical. So we got f a fairly high degree of confidence that the IMG file in the GoTech is correct. Uh, and that means in theory I can use the GoTech for uh, fault finding and also to check the validity of that IMG file. 
So the next thing to do was to try and read it and see if it matched what we're seeing from the physical drive. Because obviously what I've got from the physical drive uh, as a result of reading the uh, two operating system disks is at least some good data from the disk. And then in theory, if we can read the file that's in the GoTech and compare them, we can see if what we've done with the IMG file matches what was on the original operating system disk. Uh, if it is, then ultimately we should be able to produce some viable boot disks. And then of course we can make those available to anyone that has a REN. Few steps to go before we can do that. So the next thing was to try and read the GoTech and see if that worked. So I'll just swap the physical drive with the GoTech and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I've got the GoTech hooked up to the uh, Cryoflux system. Uh, you can see we've got the image loaded, I called it disk A. And uh, what we should be able to do now is the same sort of test. So again, we'll get a test name and we'll try and do a read. And as you can see, the disk is actually reading. And as you can see, it successfully read the disk. So what I end up with now is a file that I read from the physical floppy disk. And I've got the file that I've converted, put into the GoTech, and now read back through. And I stress here that the settings for the GoTech the interface settings and the physical drive are the same. And um, what I can do is compare the file that's just been read from the GoTech with the file that was read from the physical uh, floppy drive with the original boot disk, compare the sectors that we believe read good and see if they're the same. And I've done that and they are identical. So we've got a very good degree of confidence that um, the GoTech, as it is here, should boot on the REN. And also if we produce a physical floppy drive with this uh, IMG file uh, as the source data, as long as we get the format of the disk right, then um, it should be a viable boot disk in the REN. So uh, unfortunately it's not quite as simple as that of course because we do have uh, faults with the REN and that's what we'll turn to next. So bear in mind that uh, the reason for restarting this project is because um, I now have what I believe could result in uh, bootable um, operating system disks for the REN. And if we can get this working, then we will make these available to anyone that wants them. But um, we need to get them uh, proven first and make sure that they, they will boot as expected. So I'll get the REN back on the bench and we'll look at the next step in the fault finding. And then I'll get on to the assistance that um, I'll be requesting and see if we can make any progress. Okay, I've got the REN back on the bench, as you can see, and booted it, it into the welcome screen. And this is as far as uh, I got previously. Now, I have been doing some more work on this. I'll just go over that in a few minutes. But what's happening now is it's going as far as trying to boot from the floppy disk, and that process is failing. Uh, what's different now, however, is instead of the drive doing either nothing at all, or just continually spinning the disk, it now does appear to at least be trying to read the data. Uh, one other point is it's also looking like it's uh, able to actually read some data from the uh, floppy disk itself. So we'll look at that in a few minutes. First thing, I'll just move the camera and we'll have a quick look at the floppy disk so you can see what it's doing during this process. So it might be difficult to see, but we've got the, uh, this is the backside if you like of the drive head so this is the pressure pad uh, the actual drive the uh, read head rather the heads underneath the disc but uh, you can see um, its movement because this is attached to the uh, head drive mechanism so it will move with the head so if I try to reset the REN you'll see that the drive is actually going through the initial stages of trying to read uh, the disc contents so I'll reset So as you can see, it might not look like it's doing much, but that's quite an important step because it does need a lot of initialization and um, 
uh, if you like, control from the REN system for it to get that far. It wasn't doing anything at all before, the disc wasn't even spinning up and the drive light wasn't coming on. So uh, that's now a big step forward. Those are a few failed ICs on the board and that's what I want to come to later on. Before I do that I'll just hook the scope up and we'll see uh, what I mean when I say that data appears to be uh, to be being read from the floppy disk. Okay I don't know how clearly all this will come out on camera it's quite difficult getting everything into the shot. Ignore this for now this is just the logic analyzer connections. Uh, the device we're interested in at the moment is uh, this one so this is the um, floppy drive controller and the way these work is uh, dependent on the system they're running in and there are various different ways you can configure them so you can either use them with an external data slicer if you saw my series on the Mimi 802 and 803 machines they used external data slices uh, data slicers so when the data was coming into the board, into the system, um, it was being sliced and reconstructed using external devices that are designed to work with these particular um, floppy drive controllers. This board uses a slightly simpler system. The device does have an internal data slicer and it's that internal data slicer that's used in the REN, so the, the floppy drive controller does uh, most of the work in terms of recovering the data. When it's doing that, the interface between the floppy drive controller and the main processor, um, there's an interrupt pin that's used to flag to the main system when certain tasks are complete, uh, but there's another pin that is used to indicate when uh, a data byte has been successfully read from the source drive. And that's quite important because for the system to set or for the IC to set that bit then it has to have successfully recovered and carried out some specific checks on a data byte uh, otherwise um, it won't set the bit and you won't see any activity on that pin and that's what this system uses to decide when to read data from the IC it's waiting for that particular pin to go high and at that point it will read the data byte through the data bus and do whatever it wants to with it and then it will wait for the next byte to be read from the floppy disk. So none of that was happening before um, so I've gone through and found various ICs you can see all the ICs in sockets were faulty uh, so I've replaced those there's still a lot of faults on this board uh, but if we now at least look at this uh, particular pin so this is the data ready pin on the floppy drive controller and if you observe the scope when I press the reset button on the REN you'll see that it uh, does actually read some data so as you can see it is successfully reading data from the drive I'll press it again so you can see the line is going high and so we are successfully reading data from the floppy drive. REN's not booting, um, what's on the screen is just the same message uh, we've seen before that says to insert the operating system disk so it's not getting any further through the boot process uh, in terms of what's visible on the screen but it is now going through to the point where it's reading data from the floppy disk. So the next thing is uh, how to proceed with fault finding Unfortunately, there's no schematic that I have for this system and it's a bit of a weird design so it's, it's a very convoluted design it's very hard to uh, fault find on with a schematic it would be fairly quick and easy to resolve the remaining issues but without uh, either the source code listing or a schematic it's going to be quite difficult so that's where it's um, sort of throwing this out to anyone that wants to get involved in helping with this. Now there is a fairly standard way I go about resolving these uh, issues. I've shown it before on other videos and I'll go through what the basics are of um, how I want to proceed with this. Um, before I do that uh, just a quick uh, note that if anyone has one of these machines that they're willing to donate or sell to me at a reasonable price I'm looking to get hold of one with a 
a, a main board that I can use to reverse engineer the schematics. It's quite a big job, but to do that successfully, what I really need is a bare PCB. So what I intend to do, if I can, is get hold of a machine. Probably won't work. I haven't seen a working one yet. And then I'll remove every single component from the board. And I can then use that board and reverse engineer to produce schematics. And then I can make those schematics available to anyone that uh, wants to try and repair a REN or maybe just wants to have a look at them out of interest. Would be an interesting schematic to look at. I think the design of this is a bit uh, unusual. I think um, anyone that's interested in vintage computers like this would find it fascinating. But uh, I can't really do it with a board unless I can remove all the parts from it. And these aren't my machines, so I can't do it on these. But if I can find a machine that I can purchase for a reasonable price, or if somebody's willing to donate one, then uh, I'll be able to uh, reverse engineer this and produce a set of schematics. The problem is the three machines I have all have different faults, so I can't just take a fixed approach and when I've done one, uh, apply that to the other ones. They all have various hardware faults. So the next step, having said that, is how to proceed with fault finding on this um, particular system to try and get it to boot. And uh, also to uh, future proof the support for these. So. Uh, they do seem to be a bit flaky and they, they fail on a regular basis so rather than just repairing one, it working for a month and then being put back into storage because it fails again, it would be nice to have some proper long term support um, for anyone that has these that wants to be able to repair them. And that's, as I've said, what my channel is all about. Uh, I'm not trying to repair just one or two machines here and there, I'm trying to create um, a situation where machines like this uh, can be maintained indefinitely rather than just uh, relying on people like me to uh, spend weeks or months repairing the occasional one. Uh, what I'd rather do is use the examples I can get hold of to produce information that will help other people to um, either maintain their own or I can repair them if they really want me to but I prefer to uh, make this information available to other people and uh, kind of spread the load out so to speak. So the approach I'm going to take is what I normally do and that is to uh, break out the tools I think are most uh, suitable for this type of work and so the first thing I want to do is look at the firmware and see if we can reverse engineer it and at least figure out what's going on with this particular machine. That brings me to the second request I'd like to start a collaboration with as many people as possible to reverse engineer the firmware that's in these. I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but uh, just bear that in mind as we're going through this. If you want to get involved with uh, helping to complete this project, then uh, please leave a comment and um, I'll be quite happy to put together a collaboration to try to get a proper uh, set of uh, reverse engineered documents for this. If you do have such a thing already, then uh, please let me know. It could save us a lot of time and effort. Uh, otherwise, if you want to get involved, then let me know. So step one is we need to get the logic analyzer switched on and hooked up. You can see I already got it hooked up. I've got the address lines, data lines, and a couple of other lines that I'll come back to in a few minutes. So I'll just relocate the camera so you can see the logic analyzer screen. Okay, so looking at the logic analyzer, you can see how I've got it set up. This is very similar to how I had it set up in the previous REN videos. So I've got this in state mode. I've got the first 16 bits on pod 1 connected to the address bus on the Z80. I've got the first 8 bits on pod 2 connected to the data pins. And again, that's directly on the Z80. And it is important to understand where in the system you're looking at data and address lines because there will be some skew between the um, various locations as the uh, data is latched from one place to another. I've also got uh, a line on the in-out request on the Z80 and I've got one I've called uh, TIN here and I'll come to what that's for in a few minutes. So the first thing I did was to try to figure out where the ROM space is mapped on the REN and there are two 
uh, 64k EEPROMs in the range. So it's quite a lot of um, firmware in this. And so the way I went about doing this is just to monitor the chip select line on each of the two uh, EEPROMs and then see what the address is when they're hit. I won't show that, it's fairly uh, dull, but it's, um, basically what you do is look to see when the chip select line drops low and then you can examine the address to see what range the ROMs fall within. And um, they're both mapped to the same address. So they're both actually mapped to address starting at zero. And because they're both mapped to the same address, it obviously means there is bank switching at uh, play in the REN. So what I've done is print off the first few pages from the disassembled files of the uh, two ROMs. So if we look at them, we have this one first, and again we get the DI, the disable interrupt, at the beginning, so it's a fairly good indication that that's where it's going to jump to, and we have the same thing on the um, uh, other ROM. Looking at the start of the code, it's fairly obvious what's going on here. Um, typical bank switching, and what we're doing here is, this is the important bit, you can see that there's an out instruction where um, we're sending the value in A out to um, port 0 and also we're making a copy of a certain value so the value 8 is used to select a particular bank and if we look at the start of the other ROM you can see that that value, the, the code's identical apart from the value is 4 so in other words the start uh, first few instructions on the two ROMs is just used to switch banks between them and then what you have is just a whole load of um, jumps so we have an index jump to select a particular function and then the code jumps to the particular function within the ROM and it hops back and forth between these ROMs in a bit of an annoying fashion to be honest it's a bit, it's a bit of an odd uh, system uh, altogether, but the way that the code jumps around is uh, particularly irritating when you're trying to fault find on it. Um, but having said that, what we can do is look to see uh, what's going on. So as an example of how I'm going about fault finding on this and reverse engineering the system, what we'll do is we'll start by trapping uh, on this particular ROM and we'll trap at address 20, so this is hex of course, and that will take us to the beginning of this table. So in other words, when we come into this ROM, uh, we're going to see where we jump to, and then we can follow through on the analyzer to see where that takes us. So what we have to do is set up the analyzer to jump to address 20 when the chip select line on this particular ROM goes low. So that's obviously quite easy to do. Okay, so we now have that set up and we can go back to the waveform, arm the analyzer, and now we can boot up the RAIN and at some point we should get a hit on that address which we have done. Just waiting for the RAIN to make sure it does successfully boot up and it has, or at least to the welcome screen. And so what we can do now is look at the actual data we're seeing at this point. So you can see the chip select line, which is the blue line, goes low, and the address is indeed at 20. So we're at this point in the code. And so we're looking to see where we're going to jump to. And if we follow this through, then the next address, so this, this DD is this instruction that it's uh, reading from the ROM, and the next one should be E9. And what's happened here is the REN's gone into a bit of an, an odd mode. It does this, um, I think it's part of the issue with the hardware, and it's not properly running the processor. It's got itself into a bit of a pickle. So I'll uh, rearm the analyzer and we'll run this again. I'll press reset on the REN. It's not going back to this code without us uh, rebooting. So we'll start that again. So address 20, and we're seeing DD, which is what we should. 
next one should be E9 it has booted or started to boot properly this time so you can see it's address 21 we're seeing E9 and then what will happen as it starts to uh, read more data is it will determine where we're going to jump to so we're looking at 9D so it's C3 9D00 which is the value so it's actually going to jump to the uh, first uh, destination which is 9D so in theory we should see address 9D appear on the top line as it jumps there which it does and it should then start processing data so the next one as you can see is 9E and so at 9D we should see a value of CD so I'll just select that page in the listing okay so we're at uh, 9d and the value there should be cd which it is and the next value we she see should be ce which again it is and then the next value uh, should be 1 2 which it is and that's at 9f of course and what should happen here if we look at the actual code and disassembly is it's saying this is a call to an address of 12CE so we should now jump to 12CE and that's exactly what's happened we've got 12CE 12CF you can see it's now starting to execute code there so I'll grab that section of the listing and so what we can see this is the address 12CE and if we've got this right then the value we're reading should be 21 which it is the next value should be EA which it is and the next value should be 12 which again it is so we know we've jumped successfully so a couple of things here firstly um, we've got the right listing the right firmware code we're hooked up properly so the analyzer is able to read what we want to look at uh, but also the REN system itself is able to successfully get data from the uh, two ROMs and in theory that means that uh, a major part of the system is, uh, is functional. So when we start uh, looking at this we can start to disassemble the code. This is what I would like uh, everyone to get involved with as many people as possible is I'll make these files available to anyone that wants to help out and then going through in the way I am here just reading through and trying to disassemble the code and basically what I do is just put comments at the end of each line each block and try to identify what each uh, block of code is doing now of course this initially will be quite difficult because for example if we look in this block of code we have out instructions and we have out 101d uh, for example uh, out 01c and so we need to know what this is trying to control to make sense of the function but even so uh, reverse engineering this and just getting a, a basic idea uh, as to what the code is doing and then we can develop it over time and I'll uh, choreograph and update the files uh, as the information is fed back to me. There is quite a lot of this, there's a, a total of um, 16k in this machine so there is a lot of this to go through. So once I, we've got this the next thing I can do is look to see what is actually going on here and the uh, difficult way of doing it is what we'll start with is I have an extra line on the um, analyzer and as you can see that's um, called TIN and uh, that's the stands for trigger in it's not dedicated to any particular line but what we can do is look at the code that we're stepping through and in this case we'll now trigger from um, 1 to CE so I'll change the trigger on the analyzer and we want to set this to that address so that's 1 to CE. We'll leave the chip select line uh, enabled as well and we'll see if we can successfully capture on this particular address. So we know it's not uh, hit until we reset the machine so I'll reset the REN and indeed we have triggered. 
So what we should see now is that we're in this code directly rather than having to step through it. And uh, just to check, it should be 21 EA12. So we've got 21 EA and 12. So we're in the right place. Uh, but what we need to do is to figure out what this is trying to control. So we know it's an out. Uh, so what we can do is we can also include the out as part of our capture, which is what I've done. So the in-out request is connected to the in-out request line on the Z80. If we scroll across, when we get through to the first out instruction, which is here, then that should be at 1, 2 dB. But rather than scrolling across and trying to find it this way, it'd be far easier if we just did a capture on the in-out request line rather than chip select. Um, because the in-out request line is what we're really interested in. We're trying to capture um, this particular event. And also we no longer need to look at the address because this address is wrong. So we'll look at the address for the out instruction, which is 12db, and see if we can capture that instead. So we're looking for 12db, but we're also looking for the in-out request uh, event and not the chip select. So if we go across and set chip select to don't care so we don't care what value that's in and then we want to set the uh, in out request so when that is a one then we are uh, capturing the active uh, event so we can now go back to waveform on the analyzer reset the machine and we have captured an event so we'll have a quick look to see what we've actually captured Okay, so as we can see, we've captured the correct address and we should see IR uh, in-out request line dropping, which we do. And so the next thing we want to do is to try and figure out what device we are actually capturing. So I'll just repeat this to make sure that it's uh, repeatable. So I'll rearm the analyzer, reset the REN, and we are getting exactly the same thing every time. So in other words, we're running into this um, function the same way each time. We're running to the same address and the outline on the Z80 is being asserted. So the next thing is to try and figure out what we're controlling with this um, particular function. So that's where the TIN line comes in. Uh, what I have is uh, that line is on a floating lead and what I can do is put that onto the various enable or latch or chip select lines of uh, each device and see what happens. So if I put it onto a particular device here, I'll rearm the analyzer and then reset the REN. And we can see that shortly after the IRQ line goes low, the TIN uh, TI line goes low as well. So in other words, that particular in-out request is trying to write data uh, to the device I currently have the TIN line connected to. Cheating of course, I knew um, which particular device it was, I've done this already. Um, but this is one method you can use to figure out what's going on. So we know that um, this particular device is the one that's been accessed in this block of code. If you're interested, it's U90. I uh, don't know what it does yet, I haven't looked um, to see what the particular uh, ICs are connected to. So this is one method you can use. It's a bit long-winded because you have to go around and try every single device until you find the one that uh, has a match. A much easier way, of course, is to change the way we're going about this. So what we can do is change the trigger so that we have a much easier way to capture uh, events within the system that will point us towards the correct block of code for a particular device. So it sounds a bit complicated, but all we need to do is set the address to don't care. It's the address we're trying to find, so we don't know what it is at this point. And then we want to pick up any time the in-out request line goes low 
we're looking for out um, events and we want to look at our floating line so that's this line and anytime that goes low we want to capture the event so when both IRQ and the in out go low uh, then we want to trigger the analyzer so what I'll do now is I'll connect this lead to the same location the same device that we just looked at okay so if we go back to the waveform display uh, we can now arm the analyzer I'll connect the TIN line back to the same location we looked at just uh, a short while ago I'll rearm the analyzer and you can see that we are capturing uh, an event where the IRQ and the TIN are both going low and we can then look at the address that's um, occurring and that will take us into the correct block of code to see what's actually driving this particular event and we can keep doing this so you can see each time I reset this we're getting very similar uh, data appearing and that's all within the same block of code starting in the around 0 b um, uh, address so using this method we have a very powerful tool now for determining exactly what address range uh, certain functions reside in that drive each particular part of the system now in this case we're quite interested in the floppy drive controller so what I'll do is I'll put the TIN input to the analyzer on the chip select line of the floppy drive controller and we'll rearm the analyzer so nothing's happening at the moment it's not trying to access that device but I'll press reset on the REN and as you can see we've now captured an event where the chip select line on the uh, floppy drive controller chip has gone low and that's giving us an address of 2F28 so we'll try that a few times and see if we get a consistent result try it again 2F28 try it once more 2F28 so in other words we're getting an address of 2F28 when there is an out instruction that's referencing the floppy drive controller so in other words when we're trying to write data to the floppy drive controller we now know exactly what port is being used and so if you don't know how this works then 2f is the value that's been written and 28 is the port address so we know that port 28 is probably the uh, interface port for the floppy drive controller in the way that it's mapped into this system and of course we can then start looking to capture out events or look through the source code for out um, lines that reference address or port 28 and we can search through the source code for those events and that will tell us exactly when the source code is trying to write to the device and we can of course do this in lots of other ways we can ignore the in out request line and capture addresses for the uh, general interface to the device and see where the uh, system's trying to read data we can hook up the analyzer to the data ready line on the uh, device so if I connect the TIN line to the data ready line I will need to change it slightly because the data ready goes high when there is data so if we change TIN to 1 okay and what we want to do is um, look to see where the REN is reading the data in so we'll be reading it in through a port most likely and so what we want to do is to change the in out request uh, configuration for the trigger to a 1 which would be an in and we should now 
trigger whenever there is an in instruction where the data ready line of the floppy drive controller chip is asserted. So we'll go back to waveform. I'll connect the TIN. And I'll press reset. And as you can see, we've captured some data. So the TIN has gone high. That was the data ready line. And in out request has gone high. So it's trying to uh, do various things. When this line is asserted, then it causes the REN to do various things. And that includes reading the data from the device, but also it needs to uh, reset some internal registers within the uh, floppy drive controller so it's ready for the next byte. The important thing here however is the address this is occurring at which is 183C and we can now look within the um, source code to see what's actually going on. We also really need to uh, determine which particular ROM this is occurring in so we need to uh, also really hook up the chip select line to make sure that we understand which particular ROM uh, is being triggered here. Uh, but what we can do then is look through and see what uh, is going on, what data is being read and see if that matches what's in the, uh, what's on the, seat on the uh, floppy drive. And if it is then we know that we are successfully reading data from the floppy drive and also we know where within the source code listing uh, we're looking when we're doing the uh, reverse engineering. So that's what we're aiming for. It sounds very convoluted and long-winded but once you get this started it becomes easier as we progress because we end up with a, a memory map, an in-out port map for all the devices on the RAM board and that's what we're aiming for and as this develops if you want to get involved and help reverse engineer this um, listing then please let me know uh, I'll make the files available and then as the data starts to come in I'll uh, transcribe it all into a, a master copy that I can then make available to anyone that's involved in the project and what we should end up with um, is as I figure out what each address is. So if you're doing a particular block of code, for example, and you come across an out instruction, then what I can do is find out exactly uh, what that's triggering, and that might make it easier to um, determine exactly what that block of code is trying to achieve. It's uh, quite a tricky thing to do. It's kind of like doing a 10,000 piece jigsaw that doesn't have a picture on. Um, but that's where we are, that's, that's the information we currently have and the idea is to try to put together some information for the REN that we can make freely available to anyone that's interested. Um, it, we can't sell it, it's not my intellectual property, it's just something we're trying to do to enable these machines to be repaired uh, and maintained because at the moment there's uh, almost no technical information on them and it makes it very difficult to carry out effective repairs. So, as I said, if you want to get involved with the project, let me know. Um, that's it for this video. In the next one, uh, I'll carry on working through this. Um, maybe no one wants to get involved in the project or just wants to watch, that's fine. Uh, but I'll carry on going through this and hopefully at some point figure out what the um, fault is with this machine, but also end up with some properly documented uh, source code.